So I'd like just to take a moment to think about you as a baby. This is a picture of me, not as a baby, but as a very young girl. I'm probably about two years old there. It's a bit sobering when you look at a picture like that to realize that little girl isn't there anymore. And I don't mean because now she's a woman and somehow life has changed. I mean physically, literally, she's not there anymore. And that's because our bodies continuously renew and change. There's a cycle of life and death in cells in our body. And some of those are really fast. So brain, um, areas of the body that do a lot of work, like the lining of your mouth and your gut, those renew every three days. Your skin renews every 30 days. Your skeleton, which is alive and growing, that renews every 10 years. So you've got, by the time I'm an adult, and I'm looking back at that, she, she's not there anymore, she's physically not there anymore, except for a handful of cells in your body which you're born with, and then which you have for the rest of your life. And if you lose them, they don't grow back. And those are, if you're female, the gametes in your ovaries, the cells in the lens of your eye, the hair cells in your ear, which actually transmit information to your brain, and your brain cells. So when I look at that picture of me as a little girl, I'm looking at somebody with whom I share almost nothing apart from the lenses of my eyes that I'm looking at the camera with, the cells in my ears that are transmitting whatever it was my father was saying to make me laugh in that photograph, and my brain. And when you think about it, it's obvious why your brain cells have to be with you for life, because they're you. Everything you know, everything you like, everything you love, everything you want, everything you remember, everything you've learned, is in your brain. That's how it's represented, that's how it's stored, that's where it lives. So if I had a kidney transplant, I would still be Sophie with now new kidneys. If I had a brain transplant, I would, have, I would be whoever's brain that was. I wouldn't like that, to be honest. Don't do that to me. But it's, that, that, it's, that it's, it's your brain that's containing what you think of as you. And of course, that's almost certainly why we have our brain cells, the same brain cells, for our whole lives. So we have this sense of continuity. So continuity itself is possible. So I can remember that room. I can remember my father dressing like that because that's the same brain at work. So when we think about the brain cells, we're thinking about these really weird cells called neurons. Now, neurons are odd. All human life, all life on Earth is made up of cells. There's something called cell theory that basically predicts everything, no matter what, has got cells in it. They're the basic unit of life. But neurons, and across, this is across all parts of life, where you, animals where you find neurons, they're weird technical science term, but they're weird because they've got these branches coming off them. They've got these long tendrils. And actually, that's so they can do something really important because the brain cells aren't like files that just one brain cell sawing one thing. Your brain cells form a network, and this is why they have these tendrils, these long projections. It enables them to connect to other brain cells, and that's where the power of brains across all of nature, that's where the power comes from because brains form a network and within that, the brain cells can connect to each other, they can be activated, and when they're activated, they can, they can communicate with other brain cells and send on that activation. And that's it. That's how brains work. That's what's going on in everyone's brain right now. If we look at a brain cell in detail, they're, they're very beautiful. This is from um, a PhD thesis. Marwan Abdullah's PhD thesis, and this is just an example of a brain cell. So I showed you the cartoon before, this is the real thing. So you're seeing that cell body in the middle, you're seeing these lovely long tendrils, these, they're called axons and dendrites, and the dendrites are, they're called, it's, it's Greek for branches, so it really does look tree-like. And you can also see like a dust ring of little dots all over those projections. And those are the connections. That's where that brain cell will be making a connection with another brain cell. You get these little boutons, they're called. What they mean is buttons. And at the end of those, <laughs> oh, what, this doesn't sound quite as sciencey, does it, button? There's a button. Um, and at the end of those, there's something called a synapse. And the synapse is how the brain cell is talking to a synapse from another brain cell. And the really important part about this is it's dynamic. You can grow new dendritic sprouts. You can grow new synapses. So the power of this network isn't just that it exists as a network, and a very big network. You have 86 billion of these brain cells, these neurons, but that this, this is dynamic and it can change. 
It's also important, because we like showing neurons as these beautiful things, like, I think we're all biologists are a little bit jealous of physics, because they get to show, particularly astrophysics, because they get to show really beautiful pictures of the heavens, and we don't. So we show pictures like this, because it makes us feel a little bit like that looks like it could be a star. In practice, what you've got is those 86 billion neurons are all nestling against each other and interwoven with each other. And this is just zooming through some brain, it's actually a little bit of mouse brain. And that's actually what brains look like. You've got all these neurons internestled with each other. Every so often you'll see this little round thing in there that's full of little dots. And that's one of those synapses. That's the scale here. We're really zoomed in. But also, these brain cells, these neurons are really, really um, they're really specialized, and they require, just like a, a racehorse or an athlete, they require specialized care. You can't just sling them in a field with a bag of hay. You need to look after them. So there are 85 billion cells in your brain which are just there to care for the neurons. So half of the brain cells actually in your brain are there supporting brain cells. And that's one of the reasons why your brain is incredibly... Um, expensive metabolically, so your brain weighs about 1% to 2% of your whole body, but it uses at least 20% of the circulating oxygen in your body at any one time. So you can, it's incredibly energy intensive. Just having brains is energy intensive. Then when you start using them, they use even more energy. So to go back to that idea of you as a baby having the same brain, of course, it's not the same brain. This is a really beautiful image from Rebecca Sachs of uh, a baby and a mum being in their MRI scanner, so you can see their brains. I don't know how they did this. I find it hard enough to get adults into a brain scanner. <laughs> well done. Hats off. Chapeau. Now, you, so that baby's been born with the, the same brain it's going to have for the rest of its life. All those brain cells are the same brain cells. But, of course, they, it doesn't look the same. For starters, it's smaller. Your brain grows really, really rapidly in the first six years of life. It gets four times larger in size. So a six-year-old has a brain that's 90% the size of an adult. But also, it's changing in terms of those patterns of connectivity. Whenever we learn anything, we learn that by strengthening existing connections between neurons and by creating neurons, new ones. So that's happening all the time. These connections are changing all the time. And that makes our brains grow as well. There are also structural changes. So the brain cells themselves get bigger. And there are changes in that structure that take the brain through to looking like an adult over quite a long time scale. So if we look at an adolescent brain, I don't know if you know any adolescents or you remember being an adolescent. Things are a little bit different. They look like adults, but they don't behave quite the same. Um, and that's actually because of their brains. So throughout adolescence, the brain is continuing to develop a great deal. And this is actually sequential brain scans of people going through adolescence. The bluer the brain areas get, the more adult those brain areas are becoming. And one of the things that you'll notice is that the frontal lobes here and here, which are really important in adulthood for controlling behavior, for planning, for rational behavior, for being able to kind of take a step back and assess the situation. Those are amongst the last brain areas to become adult-like in all of us. It's certainly not there, it's not a finished, it's a work in progress still for an adolescence, which again, if you think about being an adolescent or knowing adolescents, they're not known for rational behavior, necessarily. Apologies to any adolescents here. And interestingly, in fact, all of us go through this progression of our brains becoming more adult-like, which doesn't actually happen completely until we're in our early 20s. So we really are looking at this extended progression of development. But then by the time we have an adult brain, it's not the case that that adult brain is done and dusted. There we go, off you go, there's your brain. Look after it, it's the only one you'll get. Um, because that, obviously, do look after it, but actually your adult brain is still able to continuously remodel itself. You need to think about the human brain as a work in progress, because we can still learn new things, make new connections, change our brains continuously. This is one of the superpowers of human brains. Combined with our ability for creativity and flexibility and intelligence and sort of problem solving that you see as a result of things like our frontal lobes, we can also, because of this ability to continuously change our brains and remodel and be flexible in how our brains work, we can adapt to many different situations. That's why, one of the reasons why humans are able to live in all sorts of different territories on Earth, partly because of our creativity in solving problems when we get there, but also our brain's ability to adapt to new situations. It's quite extraordinary. But also what this means is, when you've learned something, and you've learned something really well, that will fundamentally change how your brain works. And I'd just like to think about that very briefly. So I'm going to put up some slides. And what I want you to do 
is name the color of the ink that words are written in. I'd like to shout it out loud, so let's go. Red. Very good, you got there. So the reason why that works is because I'm guessing most of the people in this room have learned to read, and it is difficult learning to read in English. It takes a while, we need to be instructed in it. But by the time you are in your late teens, you are a very, very good reader, and it has changed your brain so much that you cannot not do it. If you see a word written down in a language that you speak, you will read it automatically. That's your brain, you can't turn that off. Your brain is set out to do that. You've taught your brain to do it, you can't now stop it. This, a lot of advertising and things depend on this kind of automaticity, but that's how profoundly your brain has been shaped by learning to read, such that in a task where, in fact, what you want to do is not read the words, you can't not do it. And when we got to a mismatch between the ink name and the word that was spelled out by the letters, everybody was thrown a bit. That's the power of learning. Now, I just have to take one very quick point to step to aside here. Humans have got great brains. We haven't got the only great brains. All brains are arguably amazing. Certainly, mammal brains are extraordinary. And were this talk being given at TEDx Dolphin or TEDx Elephant, I would go to both of those, by the way, it probably be, would be quite different. Elephants have got large and very complicated brains, and they're good at things we're not good at. They're less good at problem solving with us, but they are really, really good at encoding spatial information and remembering details of social interactions that can last decades. Don't get on the wrong side of an elephant, because the elephant, and I'm not even being funny, will remember you, and will, if it gets a chance, hurt you. That's in, you, can, you can fool a primate with that kind of thing, you cannot fool an elephant. So, um, just to step aside there, but in fact, we can even learn a lot about brains if we look at this fellow. So this, sorry, my phone is chiming in, my watch is chiming in. It's not about you. <laughs> this is C. elegans, it's a nematode worm, and it's the first creature to have its entire neural network mapped out. It's, that's possible because it's got 302 neurons, not very many, but it can still do a great deal with this. They can do complex behavior, they can learn to avoid dangerous situations, they can learn to do things like approach a light to get food. And in fact, if you take one cell of a nematode worm, the C. elegans, and you can regenerate the whole worm from that, and that new worm will know everything the previous worm knew. Now, we can't do that because our brains are much bigger than nem nematode worms. We've got, remember, 86 billion neurons just for scale, it, there's a, the mathematician John Allen Paulos says that when we're thinking about really big numbers, it can help to think about them in terms of time, because time is a bit more meaningful to us. So he gives the example of a million seconds is about 11 days, whereas a billion seconds is 31 and a bit years. If we apply that to brain cells, the nematode worm's got 302 neurons, that's uh, five minutes you've got 86 billion neurons, and that gives us 2,727 years, so longer than the current sort of millennia. It's quite extraordinary. And of course, again, this leads us back to the superpowers of the human brains. We've got, there's no known limit to the memory capacity of the human brain, and that's because we don't learn like a computer. We don't create new files every time we learn something new. We remodel the network that we have to learn the new thing, and we integrate the new thing into our existing memories. Our brain is changed, but it's changing those memories and integrating them into what we already know. There's no known limit to the number of languages you can learn to speak. The limit's not on your brain, the limit is time and life. I'd love to learn Mandarin, probably could learn Mandarin, have to do a job. But the, the, the limit there isn't my brain. And it is quite extraordinary to go back to the idea of you as a baby. You're looking at someone with the same brain as you and a completely different body. And of course, because that brain, you're born with it, and then it's shaped over your whole lifespan by what you do with that brain, it means actually nobody else out there has got a brain like yours. Your brain is reflecting the brain you were born with, and it's reflecting everything you've done with that brain, everything you've learned, everything you've experienced to shape that brain, and it's made it extremely unique. And I think that's quite profound when we think about why we have, it's almost like the, our bodies are vessels for these extraordinary things, and they continue to change, and they continue to learn. Welcome to TEDx Newcastle. Remember that anything you remember from my talk, or any of the talks today, will have changed your brain again. Thank you.